As France prepared to enter a second world war, a young 25-year-old Swiss man living in the French village of Taizé decided it was essential to establish a community of men where kindness of heart and simplicity would be at the center of everything. Founded in adversity, this community overcame the odds and today their songs of prayer are known throughout the world, attracting more than 100,000 pilgrims each year to Taizé. Join us as we learn more about the spirituality of this extraordinary community of faith. Hello and welcome to Catholic Focus, I'm Sheridan Sanders. I'm pleased to welcome to our studios Brother Emile of the Taizé community in France. For nearly 40 years, Brother Emile has lived out his vocation within this ecumenical community and is here today to speak to us about the spirituality of Taizé and the work of promoting Christian unity. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk about the founding of the Taizé community. How did that come about? Well, Taizé was founded by Brother Roger. He was just 25 when he came for the first time to the tiny village of Taizé. It's not even on a good map of France. It's really so small, 100 kilometers north of Lyon, the Burgundy area. It was the war, the Second World War. Brother Roger had been thinking about community life, the relevancy of community life for today. But he wanted to be in a place where there would be a challenge. His whole life through, he said, there's no creativity where things are too easy. A community should face a challenge. And so the challenge, of course, in 1940 was the war, was the welcoming refugees, Jewish refugees. And he did that for two years. And then someone told the police that he was hiding people and he had to leave Taizé. He fortunately was not there when the German army came on the 11th of November, 42, the very first day when they invaded the southern region of France, they came to the village of Taizé. Would have been the end had he been there. But he lived in Geneva from 42 to 44 and came back to the village of Tessé in 44, noticed that there were German prisoners very badly treated by the local population, began to welcome them. And then he was joined in those years, 42 to 44, by three young men who were the first brothers of Tessé, and they committed for life. They decided that they would take vows, the vows of monastic life, and thought that Tessé would just be a small community. They never thought of anything else as being a sign of the gospel, using not words, but living a sign and and so the surprise was that young people started coming in large numbers how do you see your um, your baptismal vocation as a baptized catholic um, working together with your life in the Taizé community yes i think uh, catholic, to be a catholic is a call it's not a, a label right? how can i be catholic how can i be a person catholic means according to the whole right? in greek Olon. Eh? It means that which is according to the entirety, the whole picture. Eh? We are a sect if we're only interested in part of reality. <laughs> we are Catholic when we are interested in all that exists, in the real, the reality. And so, so any Catholic, I think, could relate to that. You know, saying, yes, there's, there's a call to include in our faith the real in its fullness, to strive towards that, eh? to be enriched by that and not to be content with just a label. Hmm? It's a call. How do you live your day-to-day -day life at the community? Well, it, that kind of depends on the time of year. Uh, if you come in busy months, maybe from March to November, you will see thousands, some three to 5,000 people every week of the summer, around the same Easter weeks, week after Easter and Easter time. But then a little bit less in the winter, we will find more time for reading, writing in the winter. Even though we have these big meetings at Christmas, we still have some, some quiet time. So what is common to every day is the pr three prayer times, morning, midday, and evening, we're together. There is community. That's Even in the busy times, we try to keep that sense of community by being together, for example, for lunch. We take time, we share news. It's hard to believe sometimes on a Sunday afternoon you see 80 brothers are sitting at a table as if there's nothing to do, and then an hour later, 4,000 people are going to arrive. You have to welcome them, but it's important to be together, so we take the time. And then, of course, we go off to our different occupations. We decided not to accept donations. The brothers live from their work, so, so we, we have spent a couple of hours in some of the workshops that we have, the printing or uh, the pottery or uh, publishing, and, and so, so 
our day has this tremendous variety of things and the pastoral work of course with the people coming to search for God to search how to live their faith uh, we try to spend a lot of time listening to people accompanying them spiritually and, and so our day is made up of all of that as you progress deeper and deeper into the community life what happens at the point when you make the lifelong commitment what does that signify well, in the monastic tradition, there is this marvelous question you know, that you are asked when you are there to make your final commitment. It really is a marvelous question. It says, what are you asking for? Que demandes-tu? What are you asking for? And you don't say, I'm here to prove that I'm strong and I'm ready and I'm able. But the answer, the traditional answer is the mercy of God. I ask for the mercy of God and the community of my brothers. There's nothing else to prove. <laughs> you don't have to prove that you're ready for this or that, but you, you believe in God's mercy and you believe in the sign of community and you want to be part of that. And so, so I think the vows for us are, are an expression of freedom. Now, some people might see the vows as contradiction huh, with freedom. You know, you've committed your life to this, you're no longer available for that. Hmm? But uh, freedom is a project. Huh? It's not just our spontaneity. Huh? But it's a project. You, you want to move in this direction of commitment, of being available to God. And uh, Brother Roger used to say, of a beautiful image, I think, you know, the vows are the fire around which we dance. Right? Something is clear. That's, that's going to be our life, and we build around that. Speaking of um, Brother Roger, in 2005 he was killed. How did the community respond to that tragedy? Yes, Brother Roger's life ended in such a surprising way. You know, Ninety years old, he was assassinated, he was stabbed to death at the beginning of evening prayer. There were 2,500 people at the prayer and at the beginning of the second song, someone suffering from mental illness just attacked him with a knife and he died within minutes, within minutes. And uh, no one expected a man of peace, a man of reconciliation to die in that way. Though that is often how people of peace and reconciliation die because when you give your life for Christ and the Gospel, you also touch realities that are often very hostile. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how did the community react? Oh, we, we were stunned, uh, and I don't think we could understand very much about what was going on, how is it possible. I remember receiving a letter, uh, the community received a letter from the, the head of the Cartusians. It's, uh, it's an order in the Catholic Church that lives a lot in silence. I think maybe some people saw the movie The Great Silence. The, and uh, this man was in charge of the entire order and he knew Teze very well without having been to Teze very much, but he could, through Brother Roger's writings, he knew what it was about. He wrote to us a letter that was helpful. He said, I see Brother Roger's death uh, as something very consistent with his whole life. His whole life he wanted to be vulnerable. He didn't want to protect himself or be protected. He didn't want people to look out for his safety. He wanted to be among the people and, and, and vulnerable. And, and he ended his letter saying um, he knew that that vulnerability, our vulnerability, is the gate through which God enters our life. Many of the Teze brothers live in poor communities around the world. Why have you chosen to make this type of Christian witness? Teze started off uh, as a place where there was a great challenge, the war, and then it became an ordinary village. Uh, so where are we going to live this challenge of being in touch with people who are suffering, who seem to belong to another part of humanity that no one pays attention to? How to give a sign of universality, of communion, of unity, of solidarity? It meant going out. It meant going out of France, going out of Tizé, and we went to Algeria. Some brothers were there during the Algerian war. Then it was India. Mother Teresa gave us a wonderful welcome in Calcutta. And, and, and then the brothers went to Bangladesh. It was easier to be in Bangladesh for reasons of visa. And, and I've been living in Bangladesh for f practically 40 years, making friends with Muslims. It seemed so important. When they arrived, they said very clearly, we've come here to live with Muslims. And uh, the Christians were a little bit surprised. They're less than 1% in the population, total population of Bangladesh. But it seemed important to say it's possible. It's possible to develop friendships and trust with people of other religions. And the same in Senegal. Africa, where there's another Canadian brother with uh, uh, another brother. They live two of them, sharing the life of the poor. Great friendships that have developed in the neighborhood. The same in South Korea, in Brazil, in the very violent part of Brazil. Uh, uh, to give a sign of universality, a sign of the gospel, not so much to do 
things, to solve problems, but, but to be with people, to pray with them, to naturally you cannot be passive. I mean, so much the needs are so great that it's necessary to do something, sometimes financially or start a school or make sure that someone has something to eat. But but be with. I think that was the main call. Brother Roger really had a love for the Egyptian icon of friendship. Can you tell me more about that and the, the role of friendship in building community? Well, you're absolutely right. The, the, the icon of friendship is, the official name I think is Christ and Saint Menas. Menas was an Egyptian saint and it's a seventh century icon, so really very old. The original is in Le Louvre in Paris. Brother Roger called it simply the icon of friendship because he liked to see Christ with his arm around his friend and he felt that that's often how it is today. We, we don't know that Christ is there. We don't know that we are walking with him. We feel alone sometimes, but his friendship is there. And the whole concept of friendship was, was used a lot by the early Christians to speak of the church. We are friends of God. In the Gospel of John, of course, Christ says, I don't call you servants, but friends. And it's a challenge to discover that type of relationship. No, master-slave, we know what that is. And some people would like that relationship to God to be master-slave. But no, God calls us friends. Friend means you have to figure out what's going to be pleasing to that person. And you, you do that with your free will. You, you are treated as an adult. You are, uh, it gives you an insight into the type of relationship that God wants with us and what the church should be. The church also takes people seriously, takes personhood seriously, personality seriously. And, and uh, I think the church becomes more accessible when people realize that, that they, they are called to be who they are. Uh, Brother Roger loved Pope John XXIII. We we're so happy about the canonization that is coming up. He was such an important influence on Tizé. They had a wonderful relationship of friendship. And we know that Pope John used to read the lives of the saints a lot and sometimes be sad because I'm not like that. Hmm? I'm not like those saints. And then one day he realized, I don't have to be like that. I have to be me. God calls me to be his friend as I am. It was a day when he discovered much peace. Each year, the Teze community welcomes over 100,000 pilgrims to their site. What is that like, and, and why are people so drawn to Teze? Well, it is surprising. You know, in the summer week, uh, we go from Sunday to Sunday. People leave on Sunday morning, after, generally after the Eucharist. And in the afternoon, you see three, 4,000 people coming for a new week, and it's a turnover like that week after week. And you wonder, we wonder, how is it possible? Well, how is it possible? We couldn't do it without the volunteers who are there in large numbers to help us in, in the big, big weeks. But it's something that grew over time. There was a relationship of trust that grew between the brothers of the community of Tizé and young people from all over the world, practically. And 
Brother Rogers said very clearly to the brothers in the 60s when the numbers started to grow, he said something's changing in today's world and we have to be ready to understand, to understand those changes and to become people who listen. He didn't want the brothers to be spiritual masters uh, who would kind of pretend to know everything, and, but to be people who welcome, who welcome and listen, accompany. Uh, uh, maybe you have to say something. Uh, from time to time you have to say a word of encouragement or help someone discern, but, but especially to be... And I think that word, word got around. At Teze you go and you're respected. And young people are very sensitive to that. You know, they can come with their questions. And lots of people say, with surprise, I wasn't turned away. And I had all these questions. I didn't know I would be welcomed with my questions. There's a place for you to be as you are. Uh, you grow at your own rhythm. It's not a neutral space. There's prayer. There's a community that is Christian. But, yeah, the Christ that we try to be witness to is a Christ who walks with us. Tell us more about the pilgrimages of trust. What is that all about? So Tessie does meetings with young adults all over the world. It started off with European meetings. It, they're quite big. Sometimes they go up to also, can, for four or five days, 100,000 people can come together or... 30 or 40,000 in the last few years. Um, it's not a movement. We don't have members that would be part of Teze. It's, the Teze community is just 100 or so brothers. But to the, all those thousands and thousands of people, we always say, go back to your local church, go back to your parishes, try to get involved where God has placed you. But we realize it wasn't realistic to say that and to think that it would happen. Yeah. And so the idea came of going outside of Teze and preparing gatherings with the churches, with the parishes. And so we did that in Europe. We do that in Europe every year. The next one will be in Prague at the end of 2014. We do it on other continents. Mexico will be in May. Brother Roger thought of the idea of pilgrimage of trust. He liked the words pilgrim because pilgrimage, pilgrim, you learn if you are a pilgrim that it's a mistake to travel with too much luggage. <laughs> it's better to travel light. He liked that idea that we don't go into a situation with answers suitcases or our hands full of answers. We go in with empty hands, but we go with a spirit of trust, uh, listening, accompanying. That's how we tried to be on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation last year for a wonderful stage, step on the pilgrimage of trust. I was welcomed by the Native American people. Uh, we did the same in Rwanda in November 2012. Eight, nine thousand young people gathered for three or four days. So pilgrim in that sense, not being pretentious, not, but not being immobile either. Setting out, daring to set out. And trust, because that's the reality that is missing today. You know, without trust, what do we do? We're paralyzed by our fears. We don't take decisions. We say, I'll wait and see. Trust is the reality that is missing. So trust can be trust in God. It can be trust in people. It can be growing in self-trust. But it can also be the challenge of building trust where there was conflict, mistrust, and We've tried to do that over the years in many, many different countries. Allow something to happen. Not go with the solution, but allow something to happen by the fact that people come together, pray together, or become friends. Uh, something does happen. How do you see the interplay between your music and prayer? Yes, I think prayer is, uh, for, for, for Tese, is prayer is, is, is a lot about singing, really. And, and it's, it's traditional, I think, in, in Christianity and even before Christianity. was, But... Uh, there was a challenge for us to pray with a huge crowd of people speaking 20, 30, 40, 50 languages. How do you do that? How do you? People are together one week. They cannot learn French. They cannot all, not all learn how to sing psalms or hymns. And that's where the idea of these very short songs came up. It came up at that moment when we were faced with that challenge. And so these short Teze songs, just a few lines taken from a psalm or taken from words of a from the Christian tradition, a word of St. Teresa of Avila, Nata Te Turbe, or, or St. John of the Cross, or, or more contemporary writers, um, they enabled us to pray with this large crowd. And prayer with song has also the enormous advantage of, of disarming us a little bit in our... We, we're so afraid of God today. We see that many people come... You know, there's, the, there's these shields that protect you from faith almost because you're afraid of opening up. What happens if I open up to God? Maybe I will lose my freedom. Maybe I will become a person who reads the Bible all the time and who forgets about life. And There's the, all these fears. And, and then the beauty of the song disarms you. You open up. We're all attracted to what is beautiful, so we open up to it. And, and I think if so many people have discovered faith at Teze, it's largely because of the prayer with song. And perhaps with silence also. 
There's always a long moment of silence that follows the scripture reading. And uh, the silence is sometimes a little bit frightening for, for young people. They don't have much silence in their life. Yeah, I think singing uh, helps you to focus because you, you, know, you have the desire to pray, but you sit down and your mind is scattered. Probably we have to accept that today, that we're never going to be 100% focused. No, we're going to go in and out of prayer. We're going to go in and out of the mystery that we are singing. But the important thing is to persevere and to start over again and to realize that we don't always have time, but God has time for us. <laughs> God has time for us. That's the great wonder. No? We are very busy, <laughs> but God has time for us. and We can start over. We can can become open again. Now that you've spent 40 years living uh, in the Teze community, what have you taken away from this entire experience so far? Well, that was, that's a difficult question because it's so many different, different things over the years. But um, yes, I think, I think our life is continuous discovery, really. Yeah, about, see, the most elementary things become clear as you persevere. You know, things you were not sensitive to at the beginning, you suddenly realize this is important. Huh? This is really important. And uh, the word trust can be so abstract sometimes, and then it can be so concrete and challenging. Uh, when you're asked to go somewhere you've never been before, and you don't know how to make that possible, a meeting, a gathering. We always have these gatherings where we have 30, 40,000 people. We have no idea how we're going to find places to sleep for 30, 40,000 people. We are the first to have to do the pilgrimage of trust. So, so I've had to learn a lot about trust, I think. And, I'm, and I still have a lot to learn about trust to, to make it more real in, in life. And you learn about forgiveness. and You learn about simplicity, I think, also. I think uh, Christianity is not about proving how strong you are. It's not about proving that you're in control. It's, it is about trust in God and listening to those words, follow me, as if they were spoken for the first time. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. To find out more about Teze, visit teze.fr. Images for today's episode of Catholic Focus are courtesy of the Teze community and our friends at Catholic News Service. And that's all for tonight. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions about tonight's episode, you can write to us, focus at saltandlighttv.org. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Sheridan Sanders.